let me welcome you all for the second session for the Optom online learning series. Okay, so uh, it's been a good turn up for today. We have uh, about 90 people plus online as of now. And it was a very good session yesterday by one of our speakers, Ukti Vora, where she discussed about uh, the telemedicine and teleoptometry, uh, and you had a good idea. And I'm very thankful for your feedbacks. And we at uh, OOLS, the team is uh, working behind uh, back of the scenes to actually bring to you what best we can. So we would appreciate your feedback and uh, uh, we would definitely look into every aspect of it. So moving on for today's session, uh, today we have uh, a session on uh, binocular vision and uh, this uh, session is basically looking at what are the tips where you would actually use it in your clinical practice. So let me uh, introduce you to our speaker today. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Azam Noor Azman Azmi. He is a senior lecturer at Segi University, Malaysia. And uh, he has finished his bachelor's and master's from the UKM University in Malaysia. He's been associated with Segi University since the start of the university. So he, he's been a pioneer in uh, one of the drafting of the courses. He heads the binocular vision department and pediatric department at Segi University. And his current interest is in special population children. So he's pursuing his PhD uh, in that particular field. So uh, we are very happy to have Mr. Azam speak to us about what are the tips and what are the tricks and how do you apply practical binocular vision in retail practice uh, and i hope this session is uh, uh, useful to you please make sure to use the chat to ask any questions or anything you want to add on of course this is a learning platform as the speaker mentioned is the discussion so if you have any things which you which uh, which you have comments on which you can do better or the things what i mentioned in the presentations are something good so please make sure that you can uh, give us your questions and your comments. Right. So I think Mr. Azam, now you can take it forward from here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fakhruddin, for brief introduction. Uh, so first and foremost, good day, everybody. Uh, hopefully you are doing fine uh, in the moment and in the time and the event of uh, very unprecedented. Uh, so. As Mr. Fakhruddin mentioned just now, today is basically a sharing session. Uh, not so much of giving any tips. I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, collecting the tips from you guys as well. Uh, so that we can have a pretty good idea uh, overall how the practice, uh, especially in binocular vision practice, is uh, being practiced outside, especially in retail setup. So basically for today, uh, uh, I'm going to focus on the several components of binocular vision, uh, especially the non seismic binocular vision issues and problems, and how you can actually tackle this particular situation in the retail setup. I know the retail setup is a bit, uh, not a bit, but uh, very much different than the hospital or uh, practice-based setup. Uh, so they have a smaller... Uh, room of examination, uh, time is very essential for them. Your, uh, your input as well uh, to ensure that uh, everything is, is fine, lah, right? So for practical BV in retail setup, so these are the topics that we are going to discuss today. Uh, the first one is going to be the intro some introduction to the topic. And then we are going to have a look at these three components here. The first one is the approach on the assessment and examinations. Uh, how can you speed up? How, how can you make sure that your assessment and examination is sufficient uh, in giving and uh, arriving at the case diagnosis as well as arrive at the proper management for the non-strabismic binocular vision disorders? 
And after that, we are going to have a look at the how to quickly making the diagnosis based on the assessment that you did. Uh, and then last one, we are going to have a look at the case management itself after you make a diagnosis, All right? So hopefully this session will be uh, fruitful. Okay, and I'm again open to any suggestion and comments as well as questions from all of you. Okay, uh, first and foremost, why 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 we need the binocular vision in our practice? Uh, so as you all know that binocular vision is a rising issues, especially in uh, the current digital worlds that we are having now. Uh, so the prevalence is going to be higher and higher, keep on increasing because of the gadgets, what we are doing now, all are in-house, all are facing their phones, all are facing their laptops and all digital devices. So it is uh, 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 an increasing uh, issues in uh, and then for the retail practice, uh, this is where you can actually develop your own specialty and your own uh, differentiate you from the others. Uh, because there are many normal uh, practitioners who are actually prescribing uh, glasses, contact lenses. However, uh, to find a good uh, practice that actually can provide extra services beyond glasses is uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Malaysian perspective at least. Uh, it's getting better, but uh, my opinion is it's not enough. It's not enough for the public actually. So that's why uh, this particular sharing session is basically to tackle the issues. What are the challenges that you face in the practice and so on and so forth. And then the other reason why binocular vision is, uh, is a good uh, platform for you to start your subspecialty uh, practice in your retail outlet is because of the management and treatment of non strabismic binocular vision uh, issues and disorders are relatively uh, pretty straightforward and easy. Um, it's not as challenging as uh, like uh, strabismic and otropia cases in which it involves uh, you to actually be uh, more uh, apprehend to the situation and issues pertaining the to the binocular vision. However, for non strabismic issues, it's not a major uh, for me. It's, at least, it's not a uh, it's not a, a, a very hard thing to actually do. Okay, so let's have a look at the first topic. Uh, we are going to have a look at the assessment plan. So basically, these are the the three major components of uh, assessment plan that uh, that 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 is important in uh, arriving at the diagnosis of binocular vision dysfunction. Uh, and then uh, the first one is the history taking. Of course, uh, for history taking, later we'll, we'll have a more discussion on that. Uh, the second one is the refraction uh, because uh, refraction is critical uh, in, in, in management of binocular vision disorders. And then what are the tests that is critical and essential for virgins and accommodation assessment for non strabismic binocular vision disorders? So uh, in terms of setup and equipment, uh, most of the practice will definitely have this uh, equipment uh, with the exceptions, perhaps uh, less flippers or mallet unit. Uh, but I'm pretty sure now many practices already uh, incorporated uh, all their all this particular equipment in their practice. So for binocular vision practices, you don't require much equipment. Uh, just uh, the listed equipment is sufficient for you to arrive to the diagnosis and uh, making a, an analysis to the uh, cases that you are facing, right? And then let's have a look at the history taking itself. Uh, so to to speed up the process, basically, because I know that in retail practices, uh, the chair time is major issues. Uh, you have a very short chair time, uh, maybe approximately maximum around 20 minutes, okay, in the retail uh, practices, uh, maybe sometimes less than that. Uh, so whatever that you do, especially in history taking, must be very focused. Uh, focus on the symptom itself. Okay, because symptoms will definitely uh, give you an idea whether the situation and condition is BV or binocular vision related or other ocular problems or maybe non-ocular problem itself. So you have to focus on your history taking, make sure that you ask a correct question. And then uh, the other things that is important is 
to ask the patients to rate the symptoms. Rate here means that in terms of severity, some 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 practitioner use scale one to five or one to ten, and then grade uh, asking the patients to grade from uh, one to five or one to ten according to severity, uh, and then some practitioners just ask based on the uh, and look at the task itself. Let's say for example. Uh, reading or doing a uh, computer task or playing phones or playing uh, laptop and playing games on the laptop. So how long the patient can sustain uh, their virgins and accommodation system doing that particular task. So you can actually come uh, into mind uh, how, how, how far or how, how bad is the symptom, right? So um, and then the other issues is uh, the one that you want to do during the uh, the history taking is to know about the history of the spectacles as well. This is uh, the commonest, I would call it culprit or cause of visual discomfort, discomfort among patients. Uh, sometimes it's not much about binocular vision problems, but it is actually the fitting of the glasses is not that good. Or maybe the glasses itself has never been changed for many, many years. Or perhaps because of the alignment of the glasses is already off and then the optical center is already decentered away from the pupil. That's why patients start to have a, a pseudo binocular vision problem, so-called, right? So you want, you may want to actually investigate their spectacles as well, especially in the high prescription uh, uh, glasses. Uh, Okay, so can you still hear me and see yeah, me yeah, as well so in the slide? It's good. Yes, we can. I think your video is uh, off, I think. My video is off. The slide. Your, your face, we can't see your face. If you can on your video. I think other than that, you can continue, no worries. I can okay. see his face. Okay. Okay, okay, thank continue. you, yeah. uh, Rupala thank you. Radhika. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, just to make sure that everybody are uh, on the same page. Uh, okay, the next one will be, because we have a limited time today, so I just continue. Is If anything, just uh, put it in the chat, uh, chat room there. Uh, and then the other important things during history taking is to ask open-ended questions rather than close-ended questions. This is very critical because uh, commonly, uh, especially the young graduates, uh, tend to ask uh, close-ended questions. Uh, for example, uh, do we have headaches? The answer is either yes or no. Okay, and then how to, how to elaborate that? So you need to ask the patients to uh, in terms of open-ended question rather than close-ended question. Gain as many as information that you can from the patient, him or herself. Okay, however, uh, the, the major issues doing that is if you have a patient who likes to talk a lot, uh, then perhaps there's an issue of dragging the chair time as well. So you have to take over and take control of the conversation and maybe you can continue the conversation during your retinoscopy time or even subjective refraction time. Don't uh, waste your time too long in history taking. You want to focus on the history, history taking with regards of the problems associated with binocular vision dysfunction. And then uh, for practitioners, uh, try to train yourself to do deductive diagnosis instantly. Deductive diagnosis refers to the ability for you to rule out or include the diagnosis uh, based on the history taking. That will definitely help you a lot in terms of planning your examination uh, route later, whether you want to focus on refraction alone or you want to focus on the ocular health or you want to focus on the binocular vision components of the patient. So you need to actually train yourself uh, uh, during uh, the, your study years, perhaps uh, some of the uh, of you have done the flow chart of what to do uh, if this kind kind of symptoms. What are the possible differential diagnosis? Those are basically the the training that you went through that will be helpful here because you want to actually include or even exclude the possible cause of the symptoms so that you can plan your examinations properly 
so that you don't waste time testing all the things that you have in your clinic because i know in retail practices it is very challenging very difficult to 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 actually do everything in maybe 15 to 20 minutes it's not going to be possible right so you just have to focus on your examination all right so in term of virgin's assessment okay this uh post refraction i'm not going to touch on the refraction uh is really up to your preference but the principle of refraction for binocular vision uh, disorders is to you have to make sure that uh the mpmva or maximum plus maximum va is being followed Okay, so we don't want to overcorrect. We don't want to undercorrect the prescription. So make sure that uh, MPMVA is being followed along with the binocular balancing. Okay, those are very important, right? So after the refraction, if let's say you in your deductive diagnosis process, you already think that this patient possibly have binocular vision disorders, uh, you you plan for the virgin's assessment. Okay, so for virgin's assessment, uh, these are the tests that is sufficient for you to come up with the diagnosis later on. Okay, perform quick cover tests. That will be an objective assessment of the deviation itself. So from cover tests, you can know whether it's going to be uh, the magnitude of the deviation is going to be large, moderate or small. And then the recovery rate also will tell you an idea of the, uh, the possibility of the foria to be compensated or not. That will give you a good idea on what is the problems as well. And if you find a significant foria during cover test, it is also uh, it is important for you to actually uh, uh, look at the magnitude of the foria. It is best for you to measure the foria using prism cover test if you can. However, if the magnitude of the foria is not that large, a uh, small to moderate degree of uh, foria, uh, it is it might be slightly more challenging because uh, prison cover test uh, may not be as uh, informative as you want. So maybe you can consider performing Fourier test. Uh, so our recommended Fourier test would be uh, Howell card, okay? Uh, that is going to be quicker uh, or even Maddox rod and Maddox swing. So that is also going to be quicker. Uh, even though Maddox rod and Maddox swing have a poor repeatability, uh, however, if you have nothing else, then Maddox rod, Maddox swing can still be performed. But use your cover test uh, results as a as a confirmative fi uh, con confirmative findings, right? Don't rely heavily on Maddox rod and Maddox swing because there's too much variation between the uh, 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 for the test itself. And then after that, the NFV and PFV. Uh, this one is uh, advisable for you to do uh, for the foria that has a problem. Means that if you find the foria that is large and uh, outside normal values at distance, then you might want to focus on the NFV and MPFV at distance measurements. Uh, and if you find that the problems might be near, maybe you can't focus NFV and PFV near. Do both. Uh, instead of doing one, usually what I see is uh, people tends to do the compensatory functional virgins for the foria that they found. Uh, for example, exophoria. Most of the time, uh, for exophoria, you know that the compensatory virgins is going to be the PFV, positive functional virgins. So you focus only on the PFV. Uh, for analysis later, it's going to be uh, difficult for you to come up with the proper diagnosis if you are doing it like that. So my advice is focus on both but look at the where the foria is a problem, so, uh, whether it's going to be distance foria or near foria or both, right? So that's how you, will, you can actually, uh, that way you can actually come up with a better diagnosis and better outcome of prognosis as well. Uh, next one is going to be the ACA ratio. Uh, ACA ratio calculation uh, for, uh, for, for, for virgin assessment is, is very important because later when we discuss about diagnosis and management, we are going to rely heavily upon the ACA ratio, especially calculated ACA ratio, calculated ACA ratio. So you may want to review the calculation of ACA ratio. And then from there, you have to determine whether the ACA ratio is uh, high, normal or low so that you can come up with the diagnosis later. OK, so everybody is still good. OK, good. All right. Now. <clears throat> For the accommodation assessment, uh, basically, these are the three components that uh, 
uh, I usually practice in assessing accommodation of, uh, components of the uh, patient with suspected binocular vision disorders. So obviously, amplitude of accommodation need to be tested because amplitude of accommodation, uh, besides telling you the possible of accommodation problem, it can also give you an idea whether your glasses refraction result is over or under correct or maybe it's not balanced. So you can tell uh, based on the amplitude of accommodation testing. The second one is the accommodative facility using plus minus two diopters of lenses. Uh, so uh, you have to do both, uh, monocular and binocular. Monocular accommodative facility as well as binocular accommodative facility. Uh, because uh, if you rely, most of the time I saw uh, of, uh, some practitioners only performing BAF. Uh, but BAF, uh, you must remember BAF representing both accommodation function as well as virgins function. So it's not really a direct accommodation testing. It is also indirect virgins testing at the same time. So you might miss some um, over-diagnosed accommodation problem based on the binocular accommodative facility findings alone. So perform both. And then one more additional test that I usually recommend uh, every practitioners to do is accommodative response test. Uh, commonly, we use the MEM retinoscopy uh, findings uh, to determine whether there's any problem with the accommodation system to confirm the diagnosis later on, right? Because if you rely on these two only, sometimes it's not enough or maybe uh, the information that you obtain is not uh, enough to support your diagnosis later on. So that's why one quick test, MEM retinoscopy is good enough. It's, it's going to take you around, what, five maximum minutes of testing MEM retinoscopy, right? So all this from history taking up until refraction and then up until the virgins and accommodation assessment, maybe will take you around 15 minutes max. So try, try and practice. I know it's uh, for, for young graduates, especially it's going to be challenging, but uh, if you know the tricks and trim, uh, tips, then you may want to, you can actually uh, speed up the process, especially history taking. Uh, I see a lot of uh, undergrad students taking too long take, uh, doing history taking. Uh, but the fact is history taking can be done throughout the examination process itself. Sometimes you just uh, can start the examination and do the history taking during the refraction process, especially if you are really tight in your time, right? So that's the, the things that I can share with you. Okay, uh, now let's have a look at the uh, making a diagnosis itself. So uh, for non strabismic binocular vision disorders, okay, uh, we have three uh, possible of seven conditions that might be presented to you. Virgins problems, accommodation problem, or maybe just a, a combination of both problems. Okay. So in order to make a proper diagnosis, basically for virgins problems, we rely, as I mentioned earlier, we rely heavily upon the ACA ratio. Uh, if you refer to Shiman and Wick, uh, the third edition that I do have here, right? Uh, the flow chart is slightly different than what I'm practicing. Uh, I, I modified it a bit so that it is easier for the practitioners actually to make a proper diagnosis. So you look at the ACA ratio and determine when, what is the problems if you have that, part, that type of ACA ratio. For example, here you have a low ACA ratio. So there are two possible conditions that lead to the low ACA ratio, namely convergence insufficiency as well as divergence insufficiency, right? And then you are going to have a look at the the clinical findings, the clinical findings, if let's say the patient is having convergence insufficiency, the exophoria at near will definitely is going to be larger and abnormal compared to the phoria at distance, which is going to be normal. Okay. And then uh, it is going to be supported by a low near PFV findings. Okay. Low near PFV findings. Perhaps uh, if you want to refer uh, to uh, quickly refer to the normal normal values, perhaps you can actually have some, some printed uh, normal values are uh, in your notebook or something in your phone so that you can refer quickly uh, like uh, what I'm having here. So because I'm pretty sure I if you ask me, I can't even remember everything. OK, uh, so if you want it still require a guide, then you may want to have some 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 uh, digital copy or printed copy of the normal value so that you can refer to. Right. 
and then uh, remember that PFV is actually the direct testing of the uh, converge uh, of the exophoria, direct testing of the compensatory versions of the exophoria. Uh, but you have to look as well to the indirect findings, which is represented by binocular accumulative assessment using plus lenses. That's going to be indirect finding. So if let's say both values, direct and PFV and indirect PFV, which is BAF using plus uh, uh, plus less results is low, then you can definitely confirm that the patient have convergence insufficiency easily. So you just perform and then just make a diagnosis. Okay, so that's when it comes to the divergence insufficiency here, you just have to look at the isophoria at distance, normal or abnormal, and compare it with the neophoria, whether it's going to be normal or abnormal. For divergence insufficiency, the neophoria will be normal, However, the esophoria will be present at distance along with the abnormal values. And then you are going to also see the low NFV at distance as well. Okay, there's no indirect testing here because the NFV at distance cannot be, uh, indirect measures of the NFV at distance cannot be tested. Okay, for the high ACA ratio, uh, you can have a look. Uh, you have convergence excess and divergence excess. So, uh, so the same process, look uh, uh, at the possibilities, what are the problems, and then confirm the diagnosis based on the clinical finding. That's what I usually use and do. So CE here, uh, you have esophoria annual, larger than distance, okay, and then low direct NFV and low indirect NFV as well. So NFV indirect finding is represented by BAF, binocular facility using negative lenses, okay. And then for DE, leveraging access, uh, exophoria is going to be present at distance, larger than near, and then you have, are going to also, uh, or the patient will also have the low PFV findings at distance as well, direct PFV findings. Those are for the virgins. Uh, and then for normal ACA ratio, you have basic exophoria, basic esophoria as, as well as functional virgins dysfunction. So for basic esophoria, the process is the same. Look at the foria, ESO at distance and near, and then indirect and direct findings of the uh, PFV will be shown, right? For distance as well as for near. For esophoria, you are going to see the uh, esophoria is going to be, sorry, yeah, for basic esophoria, exophoria is at distance and at near, and both are abnormal. For basic ESO, esophoria is going to be almost equal at distance and near, and both are abnormal. And then this is the most under-diagnosed condition in the clinic. Patients usually come, shows, and turn up into your clinic with the binocular vision problems, symptoms. However, based on your testing, the minimum testing that you do, especially for your and amplitude of accommodation, you cannot draw the or come up with the diagnosis of the patient because why patient might have functional virgins dysfunction in which the foria is all normal distance and near however the pfv and nfv values are abnormal at certain distance so that those those type of patient will fall into this category of functional virgins dysfunction so uh, for further information uh, of, of this particular diagnosis top, diagnostic topic, you may want to refer to Shyman and Wick. I rely heavily on Shyman and Wick for the diagnosis. They're just uh, just making it more uh, practical for the practitioners out, out there. So let's have a look at the accommodative disorder. So this is pretty straightforward. But for accommodative disorder, the most important one is for you to look at the monocular than looking at the mono a binocular performance so excuse me any can you still hear me all right good uh so for for accommodative disorders to make a diagnosis of accommodative disorders you look at the monocular performance first aa monocularly monocular facility as well as the mem retinoscopy results so you from there, it will give you a definite idea of what is the problem with the patient accommodatively. So in terms of accommodation problem, what is the problem if you look at the bi monocular findings rather than binocular findings? Okay, uh, so as you all know, uh, for accommodative disorders, we have three major types. I'm excluding here accommodation spasm as well as unequal accommodation. 
uh, that one perhaps on uh, uh, in, in in more more uh, discussion be, uh, is required for that topic. So, so for AI, you know that it's going to be difficulty with plus lenses monocularly uh, and binocularly, along with the high lack of accommodation during MEM retinoscopy. High lack represented by high plus during MEM retinoscopy. Okay, for accommodation access, you have difficulty to accommodate. Uh, and common mistakes is to rely heavily upon amplitude of accommodation uh, because usually that is where the most of the practitioners will stop for accommodative uh, analysis. They stop uh, testing, uh, your body, right? So test up till AA and then come up with the diagnosis. This is not right because sometimes patients with accommodative access will also have the normal is AA normal AA. So don't be fooled by the AA findings. That's why you need to perform slightly more tests. Uh, facility tests will take you about five minutes. MEM retinoscopy maximum three to five minutes. So you just have to actually perform slightly more tests that you can actually make a confirmative diagnosis already. So we move on to the next one. Uh, we are looking at the diagnosis. Uh, sorry, uh, management of the uh, condition. Case management. Uh, always remember that whatever that you want to do initially, after you see the patient, you step out from the examination room or you're still consulting the patient in the examination room, you want to make sure that you address the issues of the symptoms. Make sure that the symptoms is being treated and managed first, not the system. So whatever symptom that the patient is showing, headaches, asthenopia, diplopia, okay, eye pain, eye strain, you address that issue first with the patient, okay? Whatever that you do next, okay, is to solve the symptoms first. Don't think too much of solving the symptom, uh, system. Solve the symptom first, right? Okay, so then, and then after that, after only you solve the symptom of the patient, then maybe you have, you can think and start planning for the normalize the system itself so normalizing the virgin system or accommodation system or both systems so don't don't be uh don't don't be too rush okay in uh taking a step of normalizing the system i want to correct the phoria straight away come down we just have to address the symptom first because symptoms will tell you whether the patient is going to be happy with you or not later. Because in any cases, in any situation, if your problem is being solved, your headaches being solved, they'll be happy to follow whatever that you want to do later, right? So address the symptom first, and then after that, focus on normalizing the symptom, the system. And then, common, common issues is to, uh, to make sure that the patient uh comply to whatever plan that you plan for them okay and then uh, for practitioners don't forget about maintenance maintenance will prevent the condition from recur from happening again uh you must remember that binocular vision disorders it can go away and it can come back okay so if you are not doing the maintenance uh, uh therapy or management the problems might come back sooner or later Right, so it is important for you to actually, from time to time, contact the patient or communicate with the patient. Uh, if th is there any issues after, after whatever that you do, all right, so that to ensure that the problem is does not arise again. Okay, in terms of management, basically you have several uh, management here. Okay, uh, the one that uh, for, as an option, uh, obviously for all binocular vision disorders any significant defective error need to be well corrected and then you have added lenses option and prisms okay and then vision therapy so let's have a look at the ametropic correction uh now ametropic correction is important um okay uh retic i will address your answers later all right uh ametropic correction don't discount the possibilities of small amount of hypropia or small amount of myopia or even small amount of astigmatism to the virgin system and accommodation system 
sometimes in term of visual acuity corrected and non uncorrected you it may not be significant however in term of you think about the effect of plus lenses the effect of minus lenses and the effect of cylinder lenses to the accommodation system and virgin system it may help the patient to actually reduce at least the the symptom that they are having right uh, and then if let's say the patient is already on their prescription if the glasses def improve their va as usual don't hesitate just prescribe okay All right uh, so to address the issues of, uh, from Ritik Gurnani here, uh, my 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 personal of uh, she's asking if, if let's say uh, she uh, she was uh, asking about actually alleviate the system which will eventually result in alleviating the symptoms. Yes, true. Uh, if you refer to the textbook, yes, that's how you're supposed to do. You're supposed to improve the system first, and then by the time you are going to improve in term of the symptoms you are correct however we are in a retail setup we, we we want to actually attract the patient to come back here so that's why in in my approach in whatever that i teach my uh, students to do is you want the patient to be with you and you want to monitor the patient progress because if you try to alleviate and try to solve the system it takes longer and most of the patient don't have enough patient to wait for the condition to get better okay so that's why the approach now is we attack or we solve the symptom first so that they can be relieved from whatever problems that they have and after that we correct the symptoms let's uh, correct the system back your pardon right so symptom first followed by system okay so you are not totally wrong you can do the sim uh, uh, correcting the system first however you might take longer and most of the patient may not have a patient to wait that long to for the condition for their condition to be resolved okay right uh moving on to the next one added lenses is the other option added lenses is uh referring to the type uh the spherical lenses that you add on top of the current prescription so if you have uh, basically the purpose of added lenses and prisms letter is to alleviate the symptoms immediately okay so usually added lenses and prism letter will be prescribed in the moderate to severe symptoms i come back to the history taking you rate you ask the patient to rate the symptom so based on the symptom you look at the uh, the severity whether it's going to be mild moderate or severe so those who are falling in the severe and perhaps mild you may want to solve the symptom first but those who are falling uh, or have only mild symptoms maybe you can do what uh, Ritik uh, uh, commented just now treating the system first okay all right uh, okay RJD I will address your questions later okay uh, so how to calculate, uh, how to determine what, what condition is best for added lenses. So these are the condition that is suitable to for the added lenses prescription. Uh, namely, all high ACA ratios condition for virgin's problems as well as basic esophoria. This has, found, has been found to be the best condition to be treated with added plus and added minus lenses. How to calculate those? You can utilize and manipulate the ACA ratio to come up with how many lenses or how many power that you want to prescribe to a patient okay uh, for accommodative disorders uh, we rely upon the mem retinoscopy mem retinoscopy results if high lag or high lead all right and then most of the time accommodative disorders will require plus lenses only not negative lenses so we prescribe plus lenses based on the mem results for initial value okay so if let's say your MEM results is normal, but the patient is having accommodation problem, so how are you going to do that? So you can actually trial frame it, nothing wrong with that. Again, I must stress this one, we do added lenses, we do prisms just to elevate the, sim the symptoms temporarily. So whatever that they are wearing, whether it's going to be added lenses or prism, it's just a temporary measures. This need to be highlighted to the patient. This is not permanent, this just to solve the, the your 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 symptoms but your system is still abnormal so you need to keep on reminding the patient about that point 
Okay, for Virgil's disorders to finalize the prescription here, okay, because the added lenses can cause several problems, especially blur vision. So you want to make sure that the VA is not reduced with the presence of the added lenses and the virgin system is still stable. So how to determine that? You want to utilize the mallet unit to make sure that the binocularity is still in the stable state so that the prescription can be confidently being prescribed without any issues later. And then even after that, you have to trial frame. Always trial frame whatever lenses that you want to prescribe to the patient. Maybe take outside the examination room, ask the patient to walk uh, around, sit the patient down, give them the phones, give them the reading materials, and then ask them to use the phones or reading materials for a while, maybe 10 to 15 minutes, see what is the response, see what is the issues with the glasses and prescription. Okay, the next one will be prisms. Okay, so for prisms, uh, again, same purpose, just to alleviate the symptoms in virgin's disorders. Okay, the conditions that is usually associated with this prescription is going to be divergence, insufficiency, exophoria, and convergence, excess esophoria, low ACA ratio condition, because low ACA ratio condition doesn't work well with added lenses. Okay, and commonly I will combine the prism with added lenses together. Okay, in order to resolve the patient symptoms and issues, I usually will combine prisms, prescription, and added lenses together to minimize perhaps the thickness, optical issues, so on and so forth. Right? So to calculate the magnitude of the prism that you want to prescribe, you can actually use a Schertz criterion. Okay, for exophoric cases and perceivals criterion uh, for isophoric cases to calculate the initial amount of prism that you want to prescribe. And then again, for virgin's problem, virgin's disorders always utilize the mallet unit to finalize your prescription to ensure that the binocularity is still stable. You don't want prescription to, be, to cause unstable binocularity. Okay, and then aware of prism addiction issues, especially in base out prescription. Uh, I will be very, very careful if I want to prescribe base out, okay? Uh, usually I will uh, do a slightly uh, a longer test uh, using prism adaptation test and prism, uh, progressive prism adaptation test to ensure that the patient uh, have uh, no addiction issues to the base out prism. So uh, be aware, especially based out, you don't want the patient to keep on coming back to you and wanting more and more and more based out prism in the future. So I will be very, very careful to actually, uh, before prescribing the base out prism especially. Okay, again, same the ad, like the added lenses just now, you always want to trial frame to make sure that the prisms that you are prescribing is comfortable to be worn. Because as you know, the effect of the prism is going, is going to shift your perceptual a uh, uh, vision so things are going to be lifted higher lower shifted to the right shifted to the left those are the common issues with the prescription of prism and then in the in term of prescription for non strabismic cases you can split the prism amount between the two eyes don't don't put uh, usually i don't encourage you to put the prism only on one side in a non strabismic situation Okay, and this is the most one. In all known strabismic problems, you have to actually ensure that your patient comes back for vision therapy. Very important and very critical. Okay, so vision therapy is a must. Regardless, whatever that you do, it is still a must because this is the only way to normalize the system and stress this point to the patient. Because most of the time, patient, if you don't explain to them properly, they think that the glasses, added lenses, or prism just now that you prescribe will solve their problems totally. But the fact is, it's, going, it's never going to solve the issues. This, this, the issue is still there. It's not being normalized yet. So you want this to be emphasized to your patient so that they know that they still have the problems. The, the only problems that are being solved is their symptoms, but the system is still abnormal. Okay? And then you do vision therapy uh, only when the symptom has been elevated. Okay, when the symptom is elevated, 
or the symptoms starts to be reducing to the moderate level or even to mild level, then you can start the vision therapy already. But I'd be a bit, uh, a bit uh, aggressive. Sometimes even with the precision of the prisms or added lenses, I ask the patient to go back home, remove the prisms or added lenses, do vision therapy straight away. Because I want them to actually uh, experience and notice what happens after the vision therapy. Okay, so that's what I will usually do. Okay, and then for non strabismic binocular vision disorders, always normalize monocular function of accommodation first. Make sure that the accommodation issues is being resolved first. Even though the diagnosis is convergence insufficiency, but you have to make sure that the accommodation system is normalized first and foremost. Okay, so normalize the accommodation issues first, monocularly and binocularly, followed by the Virgin's function itself. All right, James, I will come back to your question as well later. Okay. Uh, always start off with the difficult function. Means that you always start with the difficulty of the patient. For example, patient is having accommodation excess, difficult to relax. So you want to train the relaxation of accommodation. So you start putting plus lenses. So you start with the difficulty function, the, the function that has the difficulty first, rather than uh, no, not knowing where to go, right? Okay, so as I mentioned just now, I will always start with home vision therapy. This will tell me whether this patient is going to have a good compliance or not. If the patient can do home vision therapy uh, based on the log, usually I give them a log. They need to record whatever that they do every day according or not to the prescription of vision therapy given. And then they come back one, uh, two weeks or one month later bringing the log and I will see from the log is there any issues with the vision therapy, whether they are complying or not. So then I will decide whether this type of patient will be focusing on office vision therapy or home vision therapy because we as i mentioned this is retail practice you don't have much time to actually do vision therapy because uh you have uh coming in patients uh regularly perhaps so you may not have time to actually do vision therapy session in your patient so if as as far as you're concerned, you want them to do the home vision therapy as much as they can and come back just to monitor the condition, right? So try to give a vision therapy first and see for the compliance of the patient. And then you might want to change the type of vision therapy from time to time to get the boredom problems. Huh? Patient may get bored, may not be compliant to the vision therapy. Jatin, a uh, patient coming to me at retail outlet with a complaint of headache and watering after the disease, suffering exophoria. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that in the discussion session later. All right, integrate the two systems for the maintenance issues. Okay, so even after normalizing the accommodation and virgin system, as I mentioned earlier, maintenance is, uh, is also as critical and as important as the vision therapy and normalizing the system itself. You still want to do maintenance, but not as frequent as the normal vision therapy. Maybe every three months or after that every six months or even every one year. So you want to do some vision therapy that combining the two systems together, virgins and accommodation, to help the patient to strengthen and maintain the strength of the of the function and so that the condition will not recur in the future. And then, of course, when we talk about vision therapy, it involves several factors. The first one is the duration of vision therapy. So how long are you going to plan for vision therapy? Is it going to be one month? Is it going to be three months? Is it going to be six months? All this you have to really discuss with the patient and then modify accordingly to the patients, to the individual. Because in the textbook, that yes, you have to have 12 office visit of every week but in retail you don't have this privilege of asking the patient every week to come for vision therapy so you may want to sit down properly and then see how you can compensate uh, with the patient in terms of time in terms of cost and in terms of compliance issues okay so on that note i think i'm i'm arriving at the end of the discussion already uh, so I will address some of the questions later on.
So for the summary, uh, I hope many and many more optometrists are venturing and more uh, and differentiate themselves from the normal practices by uh, choosing your uh, best subspecialty that you have an interest in. Maybe you are interested in uh, special contact lenses. Maybe you are interested in binocular vision. Maybe you are interested in pediatric vision. So this will differentiate your specialty from the other practice, and then it can also improve uh, your your PR and your perception or the perception of uh, public to the optometrist profession. And then uh, personal experience, if you see a patient who have been solved or in terms of their problem, that is a very rewarding. I like to that to see them be happy again and then telling me that they, their problem has been resolved. That is most reward, rewarding aspect of practicing binocular vision. And then as a uh, treatment for non strabismic binocular vision disorders is pretty much uh, uh, having a good prognosis. Uh, so far, uh, the problem is compliance. Uh, that is the only issues. And in some practice, perhaps the cost and maybe uh, traveling and so on and so forth. And then, of course, if you are new, uh, keep on practicing. Start taking the, the simple cases first, like convergence insufficiency, which is going to be very easy, very straightforward. Uh, that you can start managing those patients uh, and then after that uh, practice and then after that increase your skills and uh, diagnostic skill uh, manage uh, analysis skill and managing skills later right on that note thank you very much i i appreciate uh you guys for present uh for attending this session today uh, i really hope to really face to face uh, seeing you again uh, uh for my students and for the rest i really Hope that in the future, when all these are over, we can actually uh, meeting, okay, uh, in person perhaps when maybe I'm traveling abroad. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, OOLS, for inviting me. So, Mr. Fakhrudin, are you here? Uh, yes. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Azam, for your wonderful session. Uh, I think we can take some questions first and then... Uh, We'll see how it goes. Let's look at some questions which have been asked. So, uh, let me just read it out for you. One question is by uh, Ritik. He he says RJD. that uh, I think you you already addressed that right. Uh, RJD he says yeah. that yeah. Uh, won't the patient feel frightened when we say about their conditions and how do you manage them? I mean, is there any tips or okay. is there any uh, uh, guidelines uh, which they can actually refer to? Okay. Uh, Okay, true, true. Uh, in any medical professions, uh, when you start giving diagnosis to, to the patient, you are going to face these challenges, like giving diagnosis and telling diagnosis to the patient. Uh, however, for non strabismic situation and issues, uh, I uh, usually it's not going to be that, that hard to actually tell because the condition is latent and then it's not going to be like uh, atropia that's going to develop into suppression, that's going to be developed into more cosmetic and functional issues. Uh, for heteroporia and accommodation disorders, it is going to be uh, easy, but you have to, I usually use uh, uh, threat techniques where I threat the patient, I warn them, if you don't do something about this condition, this will develop into more manifest situation, i.e. tropia, or maybe you have more severe symptoms in the future usually they will listen to me lah, right but maybe you some other practitioners have different approach to that uh i i saw some practitioners uh, start giving the information book uh apa, pamphlet so on and so forth lah, to to make sure that uh, they they don't really uh have uh that kind of uh, paranoid or afraid of the diagnosis itself thank you rjd for your mm -hmm. questions uh i think we have James. one more question uh yes yeah can vision can therapy DT increase vision reserve? Oh, okay. So, uh, VT definitely, uh, what we see in our clinic, it can improve instantly. The functional reserve will improve instantly. However, it's not going to be sustained. So, after vision therapy, the system will improve. But to make sure that it improves and sustain at, at, at that level, you have to do continuous vision therapy. It is similar like when you are going to gym. You don't get a buffy muscles in one day. You get that in several sessions. 
sometimes up until six months, three months, one year, so on and so forth. Same as our system of accommodation and virgins, you are going to get some effect and impact, but it's not going to be sustained unless you do a continuous vision therapy. Okay, Jatin Kumar uh, has a question here. Sir, if patient coming to me at retail outlet complaining headaches and watering, after diagnosis, we find he or she is suffering from exophoria. Uh, treatment for him or her at, uh, what is the treatment for him or her at the optical outlet? All right, so exophoria, I'm assuming this is going to be convergence insufficiency exophoria because that is the commonest type of exophoria that we see. For convergence insufficiency, you can start prescribing convergence training like broad string, convergence broad string, dot cut, or my least favorite pen to nose, lah. Uh, my least favorite uh, accommodative pen to nose, lah, binocularly. So to train convergence, but do specifically. It means that you prescribe the, tra the therapy specifically. Don't ask the patient, go and do this. That's it. You must make sure that you give like what like when a pharmacist giving you a prescription once daily this much okay same as vision therapy you do 20 cycles for uh for one week once a day you prescribe the vision therapy properly definitely they were going to be uh more receptive to that particular response uh for that type of procedures and then don't don't forget about follow-up follow-up if you let's like, say you perform vision therapy uh Usually, I want uh, I want to see them back again within two weeks. If let's say it is an issue, so for several reasons, you may want to see them within one month. That's the best if you ever prescribe vision therapy to be done at home because you don't want them to overdo the vision therapy and then other problems may start to arise. Okay, next question. Personally, from, from Nelly, sir, if a pit's H below 4 with XO, we can do pen to nose. If the pit's with ESO, is there any office vision therapy? Uh, yes, four years old, pediatric special is challenging in terms of vision therapy. Uh, it's not easy, even if you want to prescribe convergence training and therapy, it's never going to be easy. Uh, that's why for Pediatric patient who cannot understand the instruction yet or cannot follow the instruction properly, usually I will go for the for the adolescence or prism first if the condition is severe, and then monitor very closely and then try to do some activities that can make the things worse. For example, if the kid is having convergence excess esophoria, so try to ask the parents not to give the kids any tablets gadgets things to do at near too frequent or too long prevent prevent the eyes from converging first and foremost that's the only the best thing that you can actually do in pitch because understanding the instruction is challenging uh if following as well is another issues as well so you whatever that you want to prescribe in terms of vision therapy may not work as uh for the uh for the patient okay uh you long sir you did not mention about nra okay you long uh nra and pra the, the reason why i didn't focus on nra pra is because i'm i'm trying to actually look in the perspective of retail practitioners uh as i mentioned earlier they have a very short chair time they don't want to spend one hour 45 minutes half an hour with a patient doing tests so because they have the, their revenue is based on time span how many patients so on and so forth so that's why i try to summarize uh, the best examination tools and uh, and tips that you can do in the clinic quickly so that you can come up with the diagnosis and management properly that's why nra and pra is not part of my routine for retail setup However, if you are practicing in a proper practice-based and service-based setup, you are welcome to do NRA, PRA, and it is going to be a very good information to have the NRA and PRA finding as well. Okay, uh, Suri, thank you very much. Uh, Asmita, working in a retail setup and yet working in predictive population is quite challenging. Provided you have a time constraint factor too, how do you work with predictive population on the same setting? Uh, pediatric population, yes, uh, Asmita, thank you very much for the questions. 
yes, uh, I'm pretty sure the, uh, most of the practitioners have experienced seeing children, especially those below six years old. Uh, it is challenging, uh, sometimes cooperation. So I try to do as many as objective tests that I can. Okay. I will rely on the parent. Of reflection, I will rely heavily upon my retinoscopy. And if your practice can do psychopathic reflection, excellent. That is the best. And then for post reflection, okay, uh, I will try to break down the assessment into two or three sessions. So first session may be refractive error first. See whether there's any problem with the refractive error. So if there's problem with refractive error, I will just solve the refractive error problem first. We, and then maybe just by looking at the eyes, perform co quick cover test, I get a good idea whether this patient is having or this kid is having binocular vision problems or not. Okay. Uh, and then uh, if let's say the patient may have binocular vision problem after the prescription of the correction of glasses, then I will ask the parents to bring the kids back again for the next session. So I will try to break down the examination into maybe two or three visits. Uh, testing and analyzing different component of vision and then try to solve component by component rather than having a, a full data for the analysis as well. That is at least my 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 approach. I know it's not the optimum, okay, for those who are practicing optimally to the to the core. Uh, but if let's say you are practicing in a very busy practice, you have very short chair time and children as well not cooperating, then you may want to plan breaking the test into several sections. Usually what I will do, uh, refraction first, accommodation later in the set, sec second visit, and virgins in the next visit. And maybe if let's say with the issues of ocular health, I will do it as well in the, uh, after, uh, after, the net, after the following test. Okay, thank you Asmita. Payal Sanggani, virtual reality-based VT can cause more functional convergence demand. Um, okay, uh, I have a reservation on this particular topic. Uh, however, uh, me and um, one of my colleague are studying this as well previously. Uh, there are changes. There are definitely an, um, a change in virgins and accommodation status when you are doing it with the visual reality. So that's why uh, I'm still waiting for the uh, for the research, uh, evidence-based research, uh, more evidence-based research to actually support the use of visual reality in vision therapy. But I heard it works, it works, definitely it works, uh, but uh, I still have my reservation on that. I'm not saying it's not, it's not going to, uh, to be uh, improving the system, but uh, I still need, and uh, my opinion is I still wait for the further evidence-based uh, proof so that uh, then I can recommend the VR, the VR for the vision therapy. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit uh, con conventional. I know that some practitioners is already moving towards the more advanced uh, visual reality, AI, so on and so forth. Uh, but being uh, a practitioner, I want an evidence-based proof so, uh, so that I know it's going to work. But yeah, uh, we'll see about that. Lah, but to ask the question, yes, it's going to cause more functional and convergence demands than usual. Uh, whether the effect is going to be a prolonged effect or short-term effect is still to be seen. Okay, what else do we have? I think we'll, uh, we'll take one more question for today and then maybe we'll address the other questions uh, while we upload the video or something like that. Okay, uh, maybe FB, you can select one for me since you have the privilege. Lah uh okay let me let me see what is uh i think uh, okay uh no question can we okay, make good. can can we make elderly patient virgin system back to normal okay wls i think only we'll seen <laughs> perhaps okay uh wls thank you very much for your questions can we make elderly patient virgin system back to normal how old is elderly if you are talking about press biopic patient with virgins problem, especially convergence insufficiency at sophoria, the answer is no. Okay, the only thing that you can actually do and prescribe for this kind of population, uh, press biopic population, is to prescribe either added lenses or prism. 
don't worry about the system. Uh, usually, it won't get deteriorated. It won't get worse. Uh, however, if you are worried about that, uh, just keep on seeing the patient regularly from time to time. So the answer for your question, if you are talking about breast biopic population that uh, more than 40 years old, or sometimes 35 to 40 in between, uh, you might, uh, I wouldn't say that the system is not going to be improved that significantly. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Azam, for all your questions and answer session. Uh, I think there are a few more questions here, but we would address it later because we are we don't want to over exceed the time. But just a few take home messages and key points. I think what I understood from your talk is uh, I have four key points here. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, number one is look at the patient's symptoms first and then worry about the system of accommodation and virgin. So symptoms always comes first. That's the first key point what every practitioner should understand. Number two is uh, history taking can go throughout the examination process. Don't waste your time much on history taking. You will actually land up uh, wasting more time if you just do history taking in the beginning. Number three would be always trial frame the RX and let the patient have an experience in the habitual environment. So uh, that's very important point. What everyone should understand that just by thinking that adding plus one is going to help uh, not necessarily, please trial frame it and let the patient experience, let them go outside, read magazine and things like that. So that's that's the third point. Am I am I am I correct, Mr. Azam? I mean, uh, is it is it okay? These three points. Yeah, I think that basically cover the conclusion of the discussion today. Yeah, so I think uh, the take home message would help you all and uh, the, 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 mo the most important one, please start binocular vision. Once you start, you will love binocular vision and then you will start practicing it more. So, uh, yeah, that's that's the key message. I mean, binocular vision is important and we know that it can help our patients a lot in terms of their binocular problems and binocular vision problems. So start there's there's always a starting process uh, please uh, start and you will get back on track as soon as possible once you get an experience just to brief you about tomorrow's session so tomorrow we have uh, let me just put up the poster yeah tomorrow we have tom uh Mangya, i think i i think i pronounced her name correctly she is gonna talk us about wavefront optimized spectacle so she will brief us about her experience on dealing with post lasik patients and uh, patients having uh, higher order aberrations and how do we use a special type of wavefront optimized spectacles to help them uh, get their maximum visual outcome so please uh, stay tuned and uh, we have sent out the request for joining our closed WhatsApp group. So please do that and wait for our link for the third session tomorrow. Okay, uh, until then, be safe, be home and uh, have a good have a good rest. Thank you very much for joining today. Bye.